your book is our March book of the month, An Act of Love. And I wanted to start by asking you where the idea for this book came from and where the title came from. Uh, the title, I'll begin with the title because that's the easy bit. <laughs> um, the title came after many, many discussions with my editor in London who didn't like the original title, which I now can't even remember. And we back, we went back and forth, back and forth, and we were getting desperate because we were coming up to um, print time and we didn't have one. And suddenly then I just said, well, what about an act of love? And they, they just took it. It was a kind of desperate leap for a title, but actually I really love it now. And when I look at the story and where it came from, I think that it works very well as a title. Now, the inspiration for the story came from it's, it's twofold because I also wrote a children's book which has some of that area in it called um, Nowhere to Run. And that I wrote in the late 90s, early 20s. I, the idea came from, I was up in, uh, I live in the south of France overlooking the Mediterranean on an olive farm, an organic olive farm. And that's part of, you know, who I am and everything that's become my writing. I'm very much um, inspired by this area. And I happened to be the inland of here, going up into the hills behind Nice, into the what we call the Lower Alps area, in all the small villages, village, they call them village perche, which is leaning villages at the top of hills and things. And I was going through some of these and I ended up in one and they had a museum that was the size of a loo, you know, a, 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 a toilet. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I went in to have a look at this and um, they had lots of old agricultural equipment. And then suddenly there were some photographs of the wartime and very little mention of the fact that there had been Jewish refugees um, staying in this village. But I was kind of intrigued by it and I looked it up and discovered that this village voted unanimously when the Nazis breached the free zone and came in from the other side of France, hell bent on getting all this lower part of France, the South, right up to Italy into their hands. Um, nice was a big port for them and they, Marseille and Nice was what they wanted. And this tiny, all the Jews that had been living freely in the free, in the free zone when, when the uh, Nazis weren't here, um, suddenly were threatened. And this village unanimously voted to take in refugees, mm. refugees being mainly Jews, almost unanimously Jews. And the village was four or 500 people. And, by, and this was November, 1942. And by the end of 1942, there was something like 1,100, 1,200 people in the village and all the rest were refugees, speaking Polish, speaking Ukrainian, speaking any of the languages from the places where they had fleed, uh, they had fled. And, and um, they started to integrate and they created piano clubs. And it was such a, and until the Nazis arrived, and I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil what happens in yeah. the book. Um, but there were nine kind of halcyon months when these people were free to live their lives follow their faiths, be Jews, be whoever they were, gypsies, sing their local songs, their national songs, and the local people just entirely embraced them. So it's a story that I've invented entirely of a, a, a Polish family, parents and a 17-year-old girl, and they end up in this village. And it's the girl's story, Sarah's story, and it's her coming of age story, it's a war story, it's a refugee story. So it's incredibly relevant right now. If you want to get into well, the mind. Exactly, and this, this was something I was thinking as I was uh, preparing for this discussion today is how these themes of courage and kindness are so relevant today. And the idea of, you know, all these Ukrainians fleeing from home and- I We're mean, preparing I mean, our little yeah. cottage, our little cottage here on the, at the bottom of the land that in better times I used to, um, rent out for holidays and for readers to come and visit and Canadians, lots of Canadians came. Um, and I'm now, it's being renovated and done up for, for me to offer to a Ukrainian oh, lovely. refugees. Lovely. I found a quote of yours in an interview, or actually was in an article you wrote. And you said, it is the small acts of love, of generosity, and occasionally 
the bigger, more dangerous ones that give us humans dignity. And I thought that was really beautiful. And that's, that's, I wondered if the title had come, you were, you were writing about a gar, a man who was watering plants. Um, In our garden, your husband yeah. saw, and he just, he did it because it was, you know, he was trying to be helpful and. Oh, that's, that's, oh, that's during, that's a guy that came into Paris during the COVID times. Yes. And, um, he took a train every day, about a two hour journey into Paris from where he lived in retirement somewhere, I don't remember where. He took the train in, not every day, but two or three times a week to water the plants in Paris in the areas where because of COVID, uh, they'd been forgotten. And he took this upon himself. And I, he came, Michelle, my husband and I were sitting in outside because he couldn't go inside anywhere then. Um, and there he came and watered the plants right beside us. And on a bicycle, he was going from one place to another on the bicycle. And being the curious and nosy person I am, I asked him what he was doing, why he was on the bicycle. And he told me his story. And I just thought that was absolutely amazing. I, and indeed it is those small acts of love or in, or in terms of the village, because this village in the book, an act of love, um, puts itself at risk of death every yeah, single person. A large, a large act of generosity. A very large, a very yeah. courageous act of love, which is what we're seeing every day now in the news when we look at what's happening in... Oh, God, where is it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, where is it? Um, you um, were also, you were telling me, a solo traveler and have traveled to dangerous places around the world. Tell us a bit about that. I've been a solo traveler since I was 21 or something. Yeah. After I left drama school, I did, I, my first job was with Stanley Kubrick in the Clockwork Orange, two lines, but you know, what a job. <laughs> um, and, and then I did a couple of other things. And then with the little bit of money I'd earned, I went off traveling and I went to Greece and into Turkey, which was quite dangerous back then. You know, I mean, I'm talking 50 years ago. So, um, you know, I was a kid really, and I was out there and I hitched and I slept in parks and I got myself a sleeping bag. And, you know, I slowly learned the, the way of doing it. If you're doing it, uh, you know, really, as we call it here, stop like this, you know. Of course, my solo traveling has become a little, <laughs> a little bit more comfortable and elegant since then. Um, but even now, I mean, recently, of course, because well, because of COVID, we haven't been anywhere, but, um, if my husband doesn't want to go, I will still go places on my own. And I have, I wrote two books. Um, I have a series of six books called the Olive Farm series, which are kind of loosely or very much inspired by our lives here on this olive farm, this buying this old ruin and discovering that it was an olive farm and then this amazing olive oil. And it's kind of joyous love story, oh, love story of myself meeting this wonderful man and the house and the Mediterranean and the whole Mediterranean culture and all of that. And at one point, Michelle and I split up and uh, after we got back together, which is bizarre that I waited till then, but I had to look after here. Um, I went off on my uh, solo journey around the Mediterranean, 17 months, coming back some of the time, but not all the time. I did the, the eastern basin of the Mediterranean first and then the western basin. I was looking for the oldest olive trees, the olive culture, mm. the history of the olive tree, where the idea of taking olives off the tree and making oil with them came. All of this, the real, the real tapestry of the Mediterranean. Where and did it, your passion for olive trees come from? Buying the, we bought this place and then discovered oh, just it from had, there. Okay. Yeah, it had 68, 400 year old olive trees. We've mm -hmm. now planted more. We've got over 300 now. But so it came from this. I never intended to do this. I was just an actress looking for a place to hang out when I wasn't working that was warm <laughs> in the sun. So it's kind of taken over me. So, uh, you know, I went traveling. So to go around the Mediterranean entirely meant that I had to go into war zones. I went into areas where um, it was kind of hijab, you know. Um, uh, I stayed with with um, Muslim women and their husbands vacated the house and I was left alone with them and heard their stories, their lifestyle. I nearly lost my life in... Um, I got held up at gunpoint in Israel when I was trying to cross one of the into you know one of the Palestinian areas. 
Um, I've been in all kinds, Turkey, I mean, you know, I've been in earthquakes, war zones, and everything on my own. And people say it, it has been terrifying. I mean, I have taken it to the limit sometimes. But one of the great things is, I think that I come back with a wonderful sense of humanity. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. It's it's what akin to love is, um, uh, an act of love is about. It's what we're seeing right now in Ukraine. It's, I mean, I think more than anything, we're all horrified. Of course, we're horrified by this monstrous drive of the ego of one human being. But I think the, the thing that really is standing out for everyone is the humanity. Yes. And that's what I found in my travels. I mean, I, I know that you that you have solo travel women on, on this site that are solo travelers who aren't necessarily going into war zones or sleeping under bridges with etc. But I mean, I think that whenever you go off on your own, you open yourself up to the possibility of the human experience. Yes. And particularly if you're women, because, you know, because we have such great souls <laughs> and because we are we are simpatico naturally I think most of us you know um, and and I think that um, you know our, we feel each other's heartbeat um, yeah, and I, I, love I you know I you see these women coming out of Ukraine now with their children did you see those pics I don't know if they were in Canada of the woman carrying her 12 year old Alsatian the dog couldn't walk mm. and she, 20 or 30 miles from the border or I don't a distance a long distance and the dog kept lying down and couldn't she picked the dog up and carried the dog over the border I mean I've got dogs and I'm a dog I wept I couldn't mm. carry mine they're much too big but you know the humanity of that yeah when everybody is being shelled and killed by these monstrous people the humanity of that, that she risks her own life to get her dog over the border too. And in and those are the, the gems, those are the stories. I keep watching those women trudging with children and, and then, you know, you see some of them getting killed and, <coughs> and then they were arriving in Poland, in Ireland, I'm Irish, and I was watching them arriving at Dublin airport and women were running up to them, taking them arms and saying, here's toys for the children we've got a room in our house come in come in come in and you know you have to believe in that yes you yes have to believe in yeah. that. otherwise we're going to go mad with this you have and, and and that's it. as isabella lendy who's one of my great heroines you know it is the women that actually i think if, if we were running the world there'd be a lot less wars a lot less pain yes 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 just a pleasure to speak to you and thank you so much well, for I'm honored I'm honest that you found my book and that you asked me thank you very much indeed <laughs> my pleasure you well trip fiction is our partner with this so um so we'll thank Tina for the recommendation but ah okay I loved it I I, I could not put it down as I told you I loved reading it and um and I'm going to dig into some of the olive series now and Great. and learn more about your world so thank you well, I hope some of your your listeners and your your ladies will read it too. That would be great. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. And anything else you want to say about the book or life in general? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I no. I just um, you know, let's look for the small miracles every day. The small miracles. Yeah, that's what we have to look out for. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carol. It's just a pleasure to talk to you and. Thank you for making time to talk to me and, and I'll let you know how our book club goes tomorrow night. Okay, fantastic. Yes, please do. Okay, okay. thank you. Bye.